It's a pigeon. Not just any pigeon, but it's an infrared activated pooping pigeon that poos out uh, moose. Well, you'd hope it's so, but it is pooing out moose on demand whenever you go in front of this infrared sensor. Let me just clean this off my hands and then we shall explore this pigeon further. One moment, please. Big box, quite hard to fit in, but uh, the picture in the box, it's very Japanesey looking, although it does seem to be Chinese text as far as I can see, and it shows a guy dressed in a sailor outfit crying tears of joy as he gets pooed on by a big pigeon, uh, and he has pigeons in his hair. Very, very Japanese. Strange. But also strangely pleasing. Let's open this up. So the bottom bin it caps off. For a start, it's got this uh, power indicator here. Uh, if you touch it, it goes yellow, that means off. If you touch it again, it flashes cold white, and that means on. Odd choice of colours. The bottom bin it caps off to reveal the bottle of liquid. I've got the very finest whoopie juice in here. Oh, oh, that, that's not gone too well. But this bottle unscrews, and then this uh, cover bin it caps off, and it reveals that it's powered by AA cells. Oh, I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing any screws here. <laughs> Is this going to be a super destructive teardown? It could well be. Uh, right here. So I'll put this stuff out the way, and then we'll get into the teardown. One moment, please. Okay, that's that out of the way. Let's begin the teardown in earnest. Now, do I have anything that's going to come off from in here? Or is it all going to come off from the top? I think it's possibly going to come off from this end. It's time to get the spudger in and, uh, and make hideous marks in this and render it unusable again. It won't. I'll fix it. So, loud clicking noises. Oh, this is, this is promising. This is very promising. I'm wondering if there's any screws hidden under the, uh, the pigeon itself. If it maybe pops off to reveal pigeon, uh, pigeon screws. I don't think so. Although this bit is not popping off. Is it just needing a bit of brute force? Hold on, let's peek down inside. No, there's nothing else. Oh, it's just clips. It's just clips. So I just need to use the force. Use the force. Ah! The force isn't working. There we go. Any bits of plastic popped off? There's a circuit board. There are connectors, that's nice. Hold on, I can unplug this. So that's the power next to the white sticky pad. Uh, here's the hose going up to the, the schmoo dispenser. Let's unplug that. There's a little foam pump down there. Here's the connection going down to the foam pump which is at the bottom. And then we've got the infrared sensor array going into this small connector, and it's off. Okay, right. Uh, now we've got more screws here to take out to reveal the pump. I do have paper towel here for the inevitable squirting out of liquid that will occur. Uh, is this going to fit into these screws? It might be a big bit chunky. No, it does look like it's going to fit into the screws, but they are quite tight. They're self-tapped in. I could just jump to where I've taken these screws out. I shall do that. I shall jump to where the screws are out. One moment, please. And resume. Now the screws are out. So this comes off with the two battery contacts there. Uh, there's another little battery contact bridging plate. There's the pump. The pump. We know what's in the pump. We've looked at these before, but you know, I shall whip the pump out because there's no harm whipping the pump out. Are these screws? No, these screws are different. Okay. Shall swivel this bracket round to the side to reveal the pump. And the pump should theoretically just lift out like that. Excellent. There's the pump. And then we've got the little infrared sensor, which is a double bracket, one that goes down the way from the top. And then the... PCB is screwed onto the back of that. It's probably just got one or two infrared LEDs and a sensor. That is not coming out. Maybe it just requires a little bit of force. Mm, right, I'm not going to force that. Anyway, tell you what, I'll take the circuit board out uh, and I'll take a picture of it. Oh, look at this. What of that's for is that insulation against uh, one of the battery contacts or something. But I'll take a 
I'll take the circuit board out and we'll reverse engineer it. And we'll also do the same with the sensor PCB. One moment, please. Reverse engineering is complete. Let's explore. Incidentally, I chose the white pigeon, but you could also get the classic grey pigeon. I shall put that out of the way. We do not need a pigeon right now. Let's zoom down onto the circuit board. And this is the back of the main circuit board. And all that's really on the back is a ground plane, the touch button with good clearance to that ground plane, and then a code white LED and a yellow LED. That's under the little squishy silicon button that doesn't actually push down, but it just basically you stick your finger on it and it senses it capacitively. Uh, let's take a look at another module here, and that is the infrared module. The infrared sensing module that detects the presence of your hand has two infrared emitters in parallel and it's got one infrared sensor. It also has this little rubber grommet here that goes across them and it's designed to block the light from spreading between them because if light reflects off the inside of this outer sort of infrared port, it will bounce back and it will change its sensitivity, it will false detect. So they actually don't just mate the LEDs directly onto that to avoid that reflection, but they also have barriers between them so that the light can't spread sideways. And this makes a huge difference. I've used infrared sensors in past projects and the shielding of them is very important. Um, other than that, it's just the two LEDs and a receiver. That's it. That's all that's on that circuit board. The rest circuitry is on the main PCB. Here comes the main PCB. Things worthy of note. Here is the incoming supply, and there is a 3.3 volt regulator for the logic circuitry. This incoming supply also goes over to here, and there is a boost circuit that raises the voltage to 5.6 volts if it's dropped below that. I mean, it's 6 volts by default, but this means that if you use nickel metal hydride cells or... If your batteries were running low, it will boost the voltage up so the motor always runs a fairly consistent speed. And before it runs the motor, it does two things. It will, to start, it will actually trigger the enable on this voltage booster, which will step the voltage up to 5.6 volts. But then the other thing it does is it turns on this MOSFET down here, which actually starts the motor itself. I'll show you that in the schematic. There is a potential divider here that is used to signal back to this what voltage is across the motor. Um, there's the infrared detector bit, which uh, has two transistors, um, a NPN and a PNP, uh, as a little amplifier, and it's enabled on demand. There's a couple of resistors here, very high value, that are used to sense the battery voltage. I'll show you that in the schematic as well. And then there is the touch sensor chip, which has its own little filtering on the power supply here, and a little capacitor and a resistor going over to that touch sensor pad the other side. That's more or less it. Let's take a look at the two pages of the schematics. We'll start off with the power section. I shall zoom down a bit more. I shall zoom down even more at the risk of completely overdoing it. Here are the four AA cells, and there's a capacitor here for the microcontroller. Uh, that's actually the capacitor, should I say, for the, the motor boost circuit. The... Battery supply goes straight to the motor boost circuit, but it also goes via this 10 ohm resistor to a 3.3 volt regulator and provides a 3.3 volt supply. I should write 3.3 volts. And we've got zero volts here, and that goes to the general logic circuitry. The battery voltage is monitored by these two resistors, a 2 meg ohm and a 1 meg ohm, which form potential divider, but to save excess drain the battery, even though it wouldn't be very high, the bottom of the potential divider is switched to the zero volt rail by the microcontroller and then it uses a midpoint tap to measure the voltage across the batteries. When it wants to control the motor, it has this boost circuit here, which is permanently connected to the battery supply, but is only enabled by this input here. And when it is, it starts pulsing this inductor. The Collapsing field causes a higher voltage to go through this Schottky diode. That charges this capacitor. There's actually two capacitors in parallel there. So I'll draw the other one in. There is a bit of space for it. And that provides power to the motor. But it also provides power to this uh, voltage divider. 100k, 12k, 0 0.6 volt sense input. And if you uh, do the calculations, 5.6 volts is the point that will reach 0.6 volts. So they're aiming for just below 6 volts. 
That supplies a positive to the motor, which has a protection diode across it. And here's the MOSFET that actually switches that motor. It's a 2300 10K pull-down resistor on the gate. And then the microcontroller just takes that high to turn that on. OK, over to the microcontroller and the infrared sensing circuitry. Here's a microcontroller. I've drawn it that absolutely huge, massive, because I, I, I needed to bring it down for the number of lines coming in. We have the two infrared LEDs that are emitting the infrared, and they are both combed in parallel on that little circuit board, and there's one 47 ohm resistor. But then, oddly, to increase the amount of current for that, they have got two lines going to the microcontroller. I guess they've just basically common two outputs together to actually switch that. Those shine on by reflection into this uh, infrared receiver. Something else worth mentioning, if you have a unit with infrared sensing, make sure that the little thing in the front is kept clean, but avoid scratching it. If you scratch it, it will see the scratch and it will transfer light along and that can cause problems. But there's the receiver and uh, this bit of circuitry here. This line could be treated as a virtual zero volts, but Basically speaking, when the microcontroller wants to actually start sensing, it won't just turn on the LEDs, but it'll also turn on this line, pulling it to the zero volt rail to actually activate that circuitry. So just pretend that this here is a zero volt rail. Um, in fact, I'll call it V, virtual zero volt. That might make it easier. When light shines on this uh, photodiode, it changes in its effective amount of current it passes. And there's a 10K divider resistor here, and then there's a 1K resistor going to the uh, input of this NPN transistor, the 1AM NPN transistor. When that is turned on by a uh, detected current, but by the infrared light being detected, the transistor turns on, and this uh, PNP transistor is normally held off by that pull-up resistor, 100K, but it is pull turned on by this 1K resistor, and that then has a potential divider 10K pull-down resistor effectively here, and when that transistor turns on, it takes the input to the microcontroller high, positive. It pulls up to 3.3 volts when it detects the infrared coming in. Little decoupling capacitor for the microcontroller. And then the touch sensor chip has not just its own decoupling capacitor, but it has a 10 ohm resistor to give it a bit of extra filtering away from the 3.3 volt supply. And it's very basic. There are six pins, they're all, uh, they all have a function. The two that aren't used in this unit are the one that determine whether it's just touch on and just active while you're touching it, which is how they could have configured or toggle where you can touch it on, touch off. Uh, in this case, they, they want uh, it just touch sense when to indicate to the microcontroller when you're touching the pad the other one is uh, where the output is active high or low which doesn't really matter too much it's more for making minimalist touch lights so the touch sensor chip is only using four connections the power supply and then it's got a capacitor with zero volt rail on the touch input and then a 1k resistor going to that touch ring and then it's got the output going to the microcontroller after that the microcontroller has the 5.6 volt enable for the uh, power supply for the motor, the motor enable, which is the MOSFET, and then it's got the two lines going to the battery sense to enable it and actually sample the voltage of the battery. That is it. Once again, it took much less time to actually explain it than it did to reverse engineer it. Now, I could open the motor here. Shall I open the motor? Let's um, do that. I don't know if this is glued together at the top. Uh, I need a small screwdriver. This screwdriver might be the right size for this. Let's see if I can not damage it. So the way these tend to work, I'll zoom down this. The way these tend to work, the motor literally, it's usually a direct drive, I think, and it just spins a little wobble plate. The wobble plate wobbles three diaphragms backwards and forwards. There is a liquid inlet on one of those diaphragms that's this is the liquid inlet on the diaphragm and there is an air inlet which usually feeds two diaphragms now before i go any further with this i'm going to put a, a line in this let us put a green line in it so i know which way around everything goes that is the line watch me put my hand in and smudge it now so basically speaking, the diaphragm is pumping, well, one of the three diaphragms is pumping liquid, 
Two of them are pumping air. That is combined and pumped through this. And I'd guess because there's no separate unit, I would guess that in here there may be a little mesh that as the air and the liquid passes through it, it foams it up. And uh, there might be two layers of mesh. And the second layer of mesh gets the existing foamy bubbles and then it doubles the effect. Well, it doesn't just double it. It's exponential, I think. These screws are very, very, very long. They're very, very long indeed. So here is the motor with its little off-center uh, indent. Here's the little plate that wobbles. Oh, you can hear it pumping. Oh, it is pumping. It's pumping moose out everywhere. Uh, let me just uh, let me just wipe that off before it soaks into the bench. I shall just wipe it on my jacket here. And in here. Here are the three diaphragms. There's a small one for the liquid, just as well. I didn't mark which way around these go then. Uh, but if we take a closer look at that, you can see that there is the smaller diaphragm for the liquid and there's the two bigger diaphragms in the air. And as this rotates at the back, those little plungers go in and out. Well, I say plungers, it's just basically pushing the back of the rubber diaphragm. There's no actual moving bits going backwards and forwards. It's just the diaphragm being distorted. What about this? Can this come apart? Let's take the screws right out of it and see if it comes apart. But the top of this might be glued together. And if it is glued together, then it's a no bueno. No luck at all with that. Uh, there's a possibility as well that there might be another foaming bit in the... I was going to say dove. It's not the dove. It's the pigeon, but I don't think there is. I think, uh, yeah, this is, is not going to come apart. Is it a spudger? It's possible they could have had that at the end, but other ones I've looked at, like, say, for instance, coincidentally, like this one right next to the bench, has the, the mousser in here, just the layers of mesh. It's worth mentioning, these things do block up after a while. And if you were to perhaps take this head off, and then you were to push liquid with a syringe back the way in, it will usually displace all the dirt out of that mesh and uh, render it operable again. Is this rubber band. Is this going to come apart? If it's not going to come apart, I'm not going to force it. I think this might be glued. I think that's either very close fit or it's glued, and there's very good chance that to stop liquid squirting out everywhere it is glued. In which case, no, that's as far as we're getting. But that's the gist of it. Um, there are little flap valves in here that uh, allow the liquid to get pulled in and then push it out through a central port, that'll be these holes here, and then, then up through this moussing section, which has the, the meshes in it, with a spacer between them, just to create that thick, foamy mousse. But that is it. Um, very straightforward, ultra-mass-produced uh, pumps, these. But that, uh, in general, that's what's inside the, uh, the dove from above. The pooping pigeon. Incidentally, the pigeon itself seems to be mostly molded in one piece, but there's a little undercarriage under here, which has the foam outlet port and this. And if I just blow through this, yeah, it's just a pipe. There's no extra mousser in here. That pipe is just basically pushed onto the back of that. And this may just be glued in, I'm guessing, in there. Yeah, it looks like it's been glued in. So don't do what I did and almost lose the pipe up inside it. Uh, I just managed to grab it as it was disappearing and pull it back down again. But there we have it indeed. Uh, it's a nice enough effect. It's quite a fun thing. Um, it, uh, it wasn't cheap. I can't remember exactly how much it was, but I can find that out right now. One moment, please. And the answer is it was 40 bucks shipped. Uh, it's a huge box. I'm just trying to spot the box. I've put the box somewhere, but, uh, but trust me, it's an absolutely massive box that comes in. I thought they might have found a way of making it more compact and having this just clip on, but they've obviously just allowed for, for people not doing that properly and complaining and they've just shipped it in one big, huge box. Uh, but that is it. The, the, uh, poopy pigeon that you put your hand under and it poops foam onto your hand. Quite a funny, silly thing and quite a complex bit of circuitry too.